All right. Everybody doing well this evening? Yes. So you, you braved the evening thunderstorm to come out. It's North Carolina, so you know every evening from here on out, I think it's going to rain. So glad you're here. And if you're joining us online at the Facebook from the Anderson Creek site or the Rayford Facebook, thank you so much. Or if you're on the online campus, God bless you. I'm glad you're here with us this evening. We, um, let's pray and get started. Father, God, you are so good. You're so merciful. I thank you, God, for your presence and your love. God, I ask you to open our hearts and open our minds this evening that we would hear whatever it is that you would desire to speak to us corporately and individually in Jesus' name. Amen. We um, have been doing a series. In fact, we kicked it off this past weekend called Family Values. I'll, I'll never forget... I was in the conference room and a young lady came into, she came into the church and she was in a really, really tough situation and she was just looking for help. And I found myself in the conference room just, just talking with her. And I was explaining to her what Christianity is, what it means to really, really be a part of the family of God. And, and as I was talking to her, she just, she got this really, really strange look on her face. She said something, and I'll never forget it. I was, I was reminded that I was sitting over here during worship. She said, she, said, she said, Pastor Tony, everything that I valued, she was hard. She said, all my life I've put stock in, in having the, the quick quirk come back. I've put stock and I've put value in being the toughest person and, and being the person who was hard and the person who was this and getting ahead. And she said, everything that I have put value in, everything that I've always been taught was valuable as a person means nothing in the kingdom of God. In fact, it's counterintuitive to, to everything that you're telling me that God really is. And, and she was... I'm not going to say she was devastated. She was actually enlightened, but she was broken. Think about that. Think about before you were grafted into the family of God, before you had an experience with God, what things you valued and how much of a contrast it is now. And if you've been walking with the master for any amount of time, you realize that, man, my values have changed. And that's kind of what the series was about. It's kind of defining and embracing the values as a, as a family, as the family of God. I mentioned Sunday that there are, there are two families in the earth and there is a family feud going on. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy and he seeks to divide and conquer. Understand the Bible says, Jesus said it this way, a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. If you want to see a nation fall, then divide that nation and let the infighting and it will ultimately destroy it. And the enemy knows this. He's a sharp fella. We don't need to be playing checkers while he's playing chess. Tonight, in going deeper, I kind of want to unbreak, um, unpack these values a little more in something that I've wanted to teach for some time. I was speaking with someone earlier, and I was explaining how I've wanted to teach this for a while, and I was looking for the correct context in which to kind of bring it. And it's something that I, I heard conceptually many years ago, probably above 20 years ago, and I wanted to touch on it and bring, see if it could bring value to you this evening. I, I've, I call this sons and servants. And it is a differentiation between the values of the sons of God, family of God, and, and, and servants of God. 1 John 3, 1 and 2 is our, is our context for this particular series. It says, consider this, the Father that has given, the Father has given us his love. He loves us so much that we are actually called God's dear children. I tell you, every time I read that, I get this warm, fuzzy thing on the inside and, a, and an element of disbelief that God would look at us. Come on, because we know us. Your kid ever done something and, and, and you're doing this and they're going, is that your kid? And you're going, yes. You've been there. It's like, yeah, my kid just did that on the basketball court or my kid just... Anyway, but God loves us and has actually... We're called God's dear children and that's what we are. Even he puts that emphatic statement right here, and that's what we are. For this reason, the world doesn't recognize us. It has a totally different set of, of values that results in a totally different culture. And it didn't recognize him either. I take great solace in that. Because sometimes you can say everything right when you're trying to minister to somebody. 
Sometimes you can approach someone with gentleness and with kindness. And you can, you can be perfect in your approach. And that doesn't mean they're going to accept it. Jesus, I was talking to somebody, have, had a conversation in, in a, our staff devotional a while back. And, and I pointed out the idea that Jesus was God in flesh, perfectly loved. And when he would speak to people on two occasions, they tried to kill him. Now, this is God. And, you, you know, a lot of times we'll blame ourselves and go, well, you must not have said that in love. Well, <laughs> he's God. He must have said it in love, you know, and yet they still were going to stone him. Uh, why is that? It's not because who he was or what he was saying. It was because who they were. And I'll just tell you, darkness doesn't want any fellowship with light. Cain, Abel was repulsive to him. Because Abel really wanted to do what was right and honor God. And somehow it triggered something in him. And we're going to see that more and more. In fact, the Bible tells us very clearly that you see the end from the beginning. And I believe the story of Cain and Abel is just that. It is some of the tribulation that we'll face as, as Christians in the last days. As we, as we do what is right, as we make the sacrifices that are acceptable before God, we will become more and more of a stench in the nostrils of the world. And not because we're doing something wrong. Not because we're hateful or intolerant. And that's what they're going to say about us. Christians, you're hateful and, and you're intolerant and you're this and you're that. But the reality of it is that they didn't recognize us because they didn't recognize him. And you need to know that. Otherwise, your confidence is going to be shaken. You will begin to question when you run into, when you run into narratives and you run into things in our culture. You will begin to question everything you know if it's not really, really grounded in the word. Here's the, the premise of the scripture or the scripture that I want to talk to you about tonight. First, or John 15, 15, and this is just a small excerpt. He said, I no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. Now, this is Jesus, and he's speaking to his disciples. So there came a point in his relationship and his walk and their journey together, a defining moment. He said, I no longer call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. So there's three points that I'm going to say points to ponder. Three points to ponder concerning this. Number one is Jesus desires deeper. What does that mean? Yes, he walked with the disciples. There was a point where he had them as servants and they were walking with him, but he was desiring something deeper. He was leading them from a place of, of, um, of just knowing him to a place of authentic fellowship where they didn't just know about him, but they knew him. He said, I, I, I want you to call deeper. And I believe he's calling us, some of us here, maybe at that point where we know God and we know him as, as master. And that's good. We should. He, we know him as Lord. And that's good. We should. But, but just so you know, and it kind of blows my mind to think that the God, of, the God of the universe wants us to call him friend as well. And listen, I'm not talking about some of this stuff. Oh, Jesus is my homeboy. Jesus ain't your homeboy. I love you. I mean, but you, you're crazy. But he will be your friend. And there's something beautiful about that because we see over and over in the Bible where God developed such relationships with men that he called them friends. And as a result, he did the very thing that he did with the disciples. And that's this. God wants us to be in the know. I want to take you back to a place in the Old Testament where God was about to come down and he was about to smite Sodom. You remember that? He's like, I'm about to smoke that place. He said, but can I do this without talking to my homeboy? He didn't say homeboy. Talking to my friend Abraham. Is this something that we should hide from him? Just imagine a relationship with the God of the universe. He desires for us to be in the know. Do you understand that God desires a relationship with you that, that he can whisper through the power of the Spirit, through the revelation of his word, that you're not surprised God desires a relationship that is so intimate. And I, I believe that. I believe when he spoke to, to Abraham, he cared what Abraham. At one point, he said something that blew my mind. He said, come, let us reason together. This is God. The one who made him was desirous of a relationship so intimate that he could reason with him. Tells me some things. One, it tells, it tells, tells me that, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, that we even have the ability to reason with God in any capacity. One is, is amazing. 
but that God would take the time and care enough to reason with anybody. There was a few people that he, he called that he said this. He said, do I do anything in the earth without first telling my prophets? Do I not send warning? Are there not people who are closely connected to me enough that I can tell them what's going on? And all through history, we see that. We see men and women who, who said, you know what? I believe that there is deeper. Jesus desires deeper. And I'm going to walk in that relationship. And God wants to keep me in the know. I remember a while back praying. I said, God, please, will you? I may regret it, but I said, God, would you, would you please show me things to come? And I'll tell you why for me. I say this for me, not for me, but I say this for you. I'm, I'm saying, God, please show me things to come. Let me know so that I can help guide and lead your people effectively through these times. Not so I'll know, you know what to bet on or, or where at in the stock market, but when I pray, it, it's, it's, I, I feel the weight of, of, of this, of this thing as a pastor, as a shepherd, and I just want to know. I, I remember, and, and that kind of comes from the heart where Solomon, God said to Solomon, Solomon, what do you want? I'll give you anything. And he said, just, just give me wisdom so I can honor you in how I lead your people. And God was like, I'm going to give you that, boy. And because you didn't ask for all this other stuff, because I, I look at that and I'm not a dummy. I read the Bible and God saw that as a good thing, so I want to have that same heart, right? He had the heart of a son. And, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But God wants you to be in the know. Number three, and this is from that verse. Again, we're doing expository on that last verse, but we are partners, and this, is, this will blow your mind. We are partners in the mission. We are partners in the mission. That's why he wants us in the know. So it's not God, hey, goes, he goes, hey, he, it says in the Bible in one place, he said he looks to and fro in the earth. It says that of, of David, he did the will of God in his generation. In other words, he executed in the earth God's desires on his behalf. And we are partners in the mission. It's not something that we can advocate over here. It's not something that we can execute without choosing to, to join in active partnership with God. You and I, we all have a part to play. And there are things that, that we shouldn't allow to distract us or to, dis, or to disqualify us. And we should realize and really, really embrace that we are partners in the mission. So to me, those things are all massively, relationally huge. One, Jesus desires deeper. It takes faith to believe that. I'm just going to tell you. Number two, God wants us to be in the know. And number three, we, we are partners in the mission. And we should consider it an honor regardless of the cost of that mission. Now, I want to talk to you and do a comparison, and this is the part that I really have wanted to share for some time, is sons versus servants. Now, now, what I want to delineate here, I'm not saying a servant in this, servant in general context is, is not necessarily a bad thing. We are servants of God. We get that. But there is a deeper level of that. We serve God because of our relationship with God, not because of our obligation to God. And, and I want to make some distinctions between, and when I say son, that's somebody who has a right heart, and servant, somebody who is there maybe for different reasons. So I think it'll become obvious as we go through. Number one, does a son does what is needed. A servant does what is required. I want you to think about that for a minute. A son of the house looks at the problems of the house and does what is needed because it is required for the house to run. A servant in the house is going to do the bare minimum, what's required. A son in the house sees trash on the floor and picks it up and put it in the, puts it in the trash can. A servant, you have to tell every single thing to do or they don't, they don't do it. Now, what does this emanate from? Where does it come from? I, I, I submit to you it's a heart condition, one sometimes that we're unaware of. I've, I've been here. I've been in that place where I did what was required, not what I was inspired to do from the inside out, but what I was, in, or what I was required to do from the outside in. Did you hear that? God wants us to do that which we are inspired to do from the inside not required to do from the outside. Again, it is a picture of law and spirit. So a son does what's needed, a servant does what's required. And you know the difference. I know when I am in an owner-operated store. You, you, know, you, you know when the owner-operator is running a business. It's different. The attitude is different. 
It's usually excellent. Sons see opportunities. Servants see obligations. Did you hear that? Sons, and this is daughters too. You can say that, but sons just kind of, sons and servants rolls off the lip. Daughters versus servants, it just doesn't sound the same. So you're a son right now, ladies, for all practical purposes. I don't need to explain that one, right? Girls' bathroom over here, boys' bathroom. Okay, all right. Anyway, all right. <laughs> this is just for illustration's sake. Son sees opportunities. A servant sees obligations. Son says, what will this bring in value to others? A servant says, what will, it, what will it cost me to do it? Now, you tell me which one is conducive to furthering the kingdom of God, which one is conducive to running a house, which one is conducive to a church being able to accomplish what God's called it to do. And if this convicts you, I love you, it should. Here we go. Work. Sons work for mission. Servants work for recognition. Mm. Mm. Sons work for mission. Servants work for recognition or promotion. Again, you're seeing a theme develop very, very quickly. One is about us. The other is about others. What's it going to be? Working for the mission. See, because when you're working for the mission and your position changes or something changes and, and there's something that causes you to have to be flexible, it doesn't matter because you're working for the mission regardless of your position. But when you're working for recognition, it's all about position. Right? It just are. Ephesians 6.6 6 says it this way, and this is the, the CEB translation. It may look a little different if you're reading the NIV or something else, but it's Ephesians 6.6. 6. It says, don't work to make yourselves look good and try to flatter people, but act like slaves of Christ carrying out God's will. And here's the key, carrying out God's will from the heart. It doesn't say those who are obedient will eat the good of the land. It says those who are willing and obedient will eat the good of the land. See, my children can obey me out of fear of punishment. It gets them no reward, builds no character. Those who are willing and obedient, my children can obey me because they love me as a father and they see their value in the family and it's very, very different. Or not. Ephesians 6.6 6. Work for mission, work for recognition. How about this one? Sons lives, a son lives the values. A servant knows the values. Big difference, big difference. See, that, uh, that's a problem with people who grew up in church. See, a lot of us grew up in church and we know all the right answers. So we know the values. We, we understand them. We're cognizant of those values, but, er, but very often there's a, there's a great chasm between the application and the knowledge of the values. Um, this, should be, this should be very good. I mean, this is, should be something that is very clear, very clear lines. Sons live the values. Servants know the values. You know, I was explaining the definition of wisdom recently. I was trying to explain to him that knowledge is great. Knowledge will cause you to puff up. Wisdom is the, 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 the correct application of that knowledge. So you can have all the knowledge in the world, but if you don't understand how to aptly apply that knowledge, my mom used to call it common sense. If you don't have a whole lot of wisdom on how to apply that knowledge, it doesn't really do you any, you any good or those around you any good. Excuse me. Um, sons versus servants. Sons live the value. Servant knows the value. All right. How about this one? Sacrificial. Son has a sacrificial attitude. Servant has an entitlement attitude. Ooh, you ever see this? You ever see this one? How are we doing with that one? Now, this is, again, this, is, uh, this can be a servant, can be somebody who's born again. Because we're, we're talking about people who may be Christians. I was uh, talking to uh, Pastor Dan earlier about the differences between sheep and goats. Well, we were actually discussing the commonalities between sheep and goats. They both have teeth. So you can get bitten by a sheep. Have yeah, they ever been bitten by a sheep? They're real Christians. But that's why God made their teeth flat. So it wouldn't do too much damage. 
So when they bite you, it'll just take a, it'll leave an indentation. It won't take your whole finger off. Um, so it's kind of hard to tell. But sheep bite, goats bite, they do. But one way that you can delineate is a sacrificial attitude. Um, sacrificial versus self-preservation, always. One is an entitlement attitude. Anybody ever deal with entitlement? Yeah, let's just be honest. Sometimes it's like, well, I did this, so I should that. And it's very, very subtle. It's very, very subtle, especially when it comes to the house of God. See, one of the things that I believe if we're not very, very careful, we'll fall victim to is the idea that the longer I've been a believer, the more mature I am as a believer. Now, 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 this is important because I know a lot of people who've been saved a very, very long time, and they are about as carnal as the day is long. See, with a tree in the natural world, the longer something lives, generally the bigger it gets. There's a natural growth process. Not so in the spirit. Just as things can stunt your growth, a believer can be a believer for a long time, but if at any point an offense has come in and that person has become bitter, yeah, they may be saved, but I'm going to tell you their growth, their ability to progress in relationships, to progress in witness, to progress in, in the, the application of the word to them and engagement to the mission can be stunted just like anything else. Um, see, when, when opposition comes into the life of the believer, there's going to be two things. One, you can get offended. Or that opposition will cause you to grow. Um, I, was, I was listening to something recently, and it said if you are able to watch a, 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 geothermal, a geothermal satellite, I believe is what it was talking about. It said if you could actually, you can actually see during a hurricane the roots in trees going deeper because of the wind and the opposition that's coming against them. Isn't, isn't that wild? It's the same thing with us. Opposition, the enemy, we'd love to use it to draw a wedge away from us. But if we reconcile things according to the Spirit, we grow in maturity. We go grow deeper in God. And those very things that God, that the devil intended to use for wickedness, God causes them to do the very thing that he knows we really, really want. To really engage and grow in our relationship and our resemblance of, of God. So it's a beautiful thing. And I, and I sound, I, I sound, I know it sounds sadist, it's kind of sadistic when I say this, but I'm very often when, when somebody tells me they're struggling, I'm going, listen, I, I know what it means to struggle. I understand the hurt, but the reality of it's an opportunity for God to drive something very deep and very valuable on the inside of you. So when you're struggling, I believe that through the power of the spirit and reliance on the word and obedience and allowing God to pull whatever it is that it needs to get out of you, out of you, you're going to end up on your feet. You're going to be better for it. It's good for us to struggle. It reminds us this is, it, that it's a privilege and that we're in a battle. And the battle begins first and foremost on the inside of us. Because I'll tell you, the thing that you're facing on the outside isn't going to be what destroys you. It's the lack of character and perseverance on the inside. It's the lack of patience on the inside that's going to destroy you. Because if you will stand, see, Christians, we don't lose unless we quit. It just it doesn't. God said he causes all things to work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Problem is, God's good doesn't always look like we think it should look. Amen. So you want more money. You want a better car. That's good, right? He wants a closer walk where a car and the money don't matter. Come on. I'm not saying you have to be poor. I know, I know poor people that are just as crooked as a dog's hind leg. There is no virtue in poverty. So don't sit around and tell me rich people are wicked any more than you tell me that poor people are righteous. A lot of poor people are poor because they bad, have bad stewardship and, 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 and God, and won't, God won't bless their mess. And some of the rich people are rich because they've been benevolent. Give and it'll be given unto you. Good measure, Preston. I can't change the word. It's what it says. You're one of those prosperity preachers. No, I'm a word preacher and he happens to be in there and I can't pull it out and throw it away because you don't like the theology. Anyway, that's not a particular theology that I'm adopted. It's just a verse that's in the Bible. All right, I'm rambling. All right. But the sacrificial attitude, which is where I'm not afraid if it costs me something because God's going to call you to something big. And I promise you, whatever he calls you to is going to, have a, it's going to have a price tag hooked to it. There has been so many times that God has called me to walk through, and maybe you all understand this analogy. Maybe God always calls you to walk through the pretty door. You know, the nice one. I get the ugly one. 
I get the one that has all the junk on it and the hinge is rusted and I have to bend and contort to get through the stinking thing and it's okay. It's okay. God calls us and, and he, he knows what we need and he understands that there's a sacrifice. But I do, however, have to fight that tendency to go, God, would you please just open an easy door? I'm going, God, would you for one time this year just let something we planned actually happen like we planned it? Anybody else feel that way? <laughs> I am boycotting 2020. Amen to that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding, kind of. All right, next. Look at it. We're almost done. We're almost done here. Let's see how many more we got. Okay, we're not almost done. We are almost done. We're almost done. How about this one? And this is huge. This is huge. Now, this kind of get, get you where you are. And listen, I, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with rules. Okay? I'm not, I'm not saying that. But sons value good and just and right Servants very often can't see beyond the rules. They indiscriminately apply the rules to them and the rules to other, even if it's not necessarily for the good. I, I'm not one of those people who said rules were made to be broken. I don't think we need to be rebellious at heart. But I want you to hear what I'm saying. I say this to the staff. I, I say this to volunteers. You have my permission to do what's right. You are not going to get in trouble for doing what's right and what you believe is good I had a staff member who took it upon themselves to do something very very good for somebody she happens to be sitting in this room right now so I'm not going to say her name but she took it upon herself to do something very very good in in her heart I'm not saying it was right but I understand her intentions and not that she'll ever do it again but sometimes you just have to do what's good Especially when, you know, when there's not a rule concerning it to constrain you, you might as well just do it. But my, my point is we should always feel the liberty of the Spirit to do what's right. Even if it doesn't always look ex exactly according to what people might think is right. No, the Bible does say don't let your, your good be evil spoken of. I think we need to be wise. But we value good. We value judgment. We value justice, good judgment. We value justice. And, and, and other people who are servants can never see beyond the rules. See, the good is something that emanates from our hearts because of who we are, made in the image of God. It, it, it tests every situation, every circumstance, and goes, what's right? The pastors on staff, I'll just, I'll just tell you, they know. I trust them. They're shepherds because they have a heart on the inside of them. And they're on staff because they have a heart on the inside of them where I know that when they're in a difficult situation, they, they're going to do what's right. And they're going to do what's good, even if it is sacrificial or costs them something. All right. How about this one? Sons value authenticity. Servants value perception. I think I spelled that right. Yes. Now, now this is huge. Sons value authenticity. Servants are concerned with how it looks. Who's watching? Did it look okay? See, it's not enough for a son to just do what's right. A true son wants to do what's right for the right reasons. You're going to hear this. You're going to hear these themes. There are certain themes in the family, in our family values, that they're always going to be. And I believe this is what our world needs, not somebody. See, the valuing authenticity over perception will give you incredible boldness because people are going to make accusations against you. And when you understand that you're walking in authenticity, it gives you the ability to walk in boldness, not accept their narrative. Look them in the eye and go, you know what? I love you, but you're full of mm, and you don't know what you're talking about. I said, mm. Not very pastorly. But the attitude is, sorry, I never said I was good at this, okay? It's yes, it's Wednesday. <laughs> Somebody's got some grace in here for me. That meant nice to you. I'm just saying. Anyway, uh, but, and, and for me and for you, because there's been times that I didn't want to do what was the right thing that I knew the Bible told me to do. Anybody have that struggle? Amen. I didn't want to, which 
puts me in a position where I say, God, please change my want to her. Anybody got a want to her? You understand it's God who both wills and to do of his good pleasure. It starts with an inner transformation. And it's okay if we realize authentically that, God, I still have areas of my heart that need to be transformed. Listen, that type of authenticity will also give you boldness when you're accused of areas in your heart that have been transformed. You understand? I've had people look at me and go, Tony, you are blah, blah, blah. And I'll go, I love you, but you're wrong. And my world is not shaken because the accuser of the brethren. See, Satan is the accuser. He lives to accuse you. If you do not walk in the power of authenticity, then every accusation is going to cause you to crumble and cringe before every accusation. And I can promise you this. The enemy is constantly accusing you either to somebody or before God himself. But we have an advocate who goes, look, I know that boy. Yeah, he ain't right, but I'm working on his want to her. God working on anybody's want to her in here? Just let him work on your want to her. All right, okay. And then this last point. And, and don't get mad at me because of this, but I'm just telling you, this is no substitute. Sons are loving servants are religious. Now, you don't have to be a Christian to be religious. You can be religious about a lot of things. You can be religious about, about uh, what's that? Um, what's it called when somebody's really religious about keeping everything, recycling and all that? What, what do you call that? Green. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you see, it is in people's heart to be religious if, if they don't have love. I'm telling you, People will substitute. People will be religious about keeping everything green or tree hugging, whatever. Anyway, people will be religious about not eating animals. And I'm okay with that. I'm just saying I'll meet you where you are. But I'm just saying if we're not careful, we will fall into some type of religion and it doesn't always look like Christianity. See, if you grew up in church, then you will adopt the religious activities of that organization. But you may not have what started it to begin with, the love, which is the whole point of it all. Because as we read this past weekend, you can have all of this, you can have everything in the world, but if you don't have love, then nothing that you do is going to profit you. You could sacrifice everything you have to save the baby whales. You're religious. You can, you can religiously try to save the baby seals or whales or water buffaloes or chickens, but it's not going to matter if you don't have love. And then you, you, you wrap it, and then we come and say, well, you know what, I'm, gonna, I, I'm for the church. I'm going to sing in the choir. We don't have a choir, but if we did, I want to sing in the choir. I want to do this, and you can be very religious about that, and you can never miss a service, and that becomes your religious substitution for the very thing that God wants to put on the inside of every one of us, which is transforming love. It's what we talked about. It's the very value that differentiates between the, the two families that are in the earth, and we're going to end with this. There's one family in the earth, born of Almighty God. God is love, inspired by, empowered by, led by, acting and walking in love. The other, no matter what, there's always a selfish motivation. This is the family that we are. It's what we're called to be. A family that walks in lockstep with the God of love to show that love. All of us know what that looks like. Jesus said some things that when the world hates you, when people accuse you, we don't turn around and switch families and give them back what we're getting. You know, that's hard. Sometimes my wife is perfect. Sometimes she loses her perfection and says something ugly to me. I mean, yours may not do that. I'm not picking on you, Kim. But sometimes she steps out of her perfect and says something and... and Everything in me that's not of God wants to say something ugly back. That's not what we're called to. And the problem is, is as long as we keep that cycle going in our lives, until we really embr embrace our identity as sons of Almighty God, destined and called to walk in love, we're going to keep those deadly cycles going in our lives. We blame everybody, but here's the beauty. At any time, we have the power to stop it. At any time, we can not only live in the family of God, but we can adopt the responses and the traits and the values, and we can create that culture of God on heaven, our culture of heaven on earth, by walking in love. 
So as you look through these, there may be some that, that strike home. Think of which ones that the Holy Spirit has spoken to you, which ones we can press more into as we go through these values. And we're going to be on part two of, of that this weekend. So if you've got some of the value sheets, bring them with you. We'll, ha we'll have some fresh ones or whatever. But I, I want to thank you for coming this evening. I want to pray with you and then we'll get out of here, okay? Father, we, we are your children. God, I thank you that we have been made perfect in you through the blood of Jesus Christ. We put our full hope in everything that he did on our behalf. Father, I'm going to ask you by the power of your spirit, please don't give up on us. You said, God, that you were returning for a church without spot or blemish, without spot or wrinkle. God, you know what it's going to take to get us there. But you know, God, we have been born again, given a desire to get there by you, which is the evidence that you will bring us to that promised land. What is that promised land? That's the place where you are and we are like you. Father, draw us to you like never before. Create in us, Father God, that beautiful, spotless, authentic, loving heart. The very heart that was in your son Jesus lived out before us on this earth. And we will be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. And God bless you. Thank you so much for coming.